Hello, this is Aloisa with Math Leopard. Today I'm going to cover the many phases of the transcendental number pi as seen throughout the different disciplines within mathematics. We begin with the most fundamental definition, seen in the geometry of a circle and its diameter. We have that pi is a quotient of the length of the circumference and the diameter. Retaining the circle for the moment, we now proceed on to trigonometry and the unit circle. We know from geometry that the circumference is pi times the diameter, or pi times twice the radius. Hence, we subtend 2 pi radii along the circumference of any circle, and exactly 2 pi along the unit circle. As such, each of the angles can be represented as a fraction of 2 pi. The 90 degree angles, or the four directions, partition the circle into four parts. Hence, 2 pi divided by 4 results in multiples of pi over 2 for each of the cardinal directions. The 45 degree angles divide the circle into 8. Hence, 2 pi divided by 8 gives us multiples of pi over 4. Similarly, the 30 degree angles, as measured from the x-axis, divide the circle into 12. Hence, 2 pi over 12 gives us multiples of pi over 6. Finally, the 60 degree angles, as measured from the x-axis, divide the circle into 6. Hence, 2 pi over 6 yields multiples of pi over 3. In order to return to pi, we see that cosine inverse of negative 1, or arc cosine of negative 1, is equals to pi, and twice sine inverse of 1 is pi, as well as 4 times arc tangent of pi over 4. In fact, this circle gives us infinitely many inverse trigonometric functions, which are directly proportional to pi. We now straddle the realm between trigonometry and calculus. Let us consider the graph of arc tangent of x. We know that our two horizontal asymptotes will occur at plus or minus pi over 2. And hence, as our value for x increases without bound, the value of this function approaches pi over 2. That is, pi in this instance can be written as twice the limit as x increases without bound of arc tangent of x. We next proceed into the heart of calculus with a Maclaurin series. We know that a function f of x, which is infinitely many times continuously differentiable, can be written as the sum as our index n begins counting at 0 and increases without bound of the nth derivative of f at 0 divided by n factorial quantity times x to the n. Let us consider the function from our last definition for pi, namely arctangent of x. The value of this function at 0 is 0. The value of its first derivative at 0 is 1, or 0 factorial. The value of its second derivative at 0 is 0, and the value of its third derivative at 0 is the negative of 2 factorial. Once again, the next derivative at 0 is 0, after which the fifth derivative at 0 is 4 factorial. Then 0 once again, followed by a value of negative 6 factorial for the seventh derivative at 0. The pattern here is that the even-indexed derivatives have a value of 0 at 0, whereas the odd-indexed derivatives have a value of negative 1 raised to the index n times n minus 1 factorial. From this we can find our Maclaurin series, beginning with 0 factorial over 1 factorial times x, minus 2 factorial over 3 factorial times x cubed, plus 4 factorial over 5 factorial times x to the fifth, minus 6 factorial over 7 factorial times x to the 7th, plus dot dot dot. We see that each term is the quotient of subsequent factorials, therefore they simplify to the ratio of x to the n over n in each case. Hence, the series representation is given by the sum, as our index n counts from 0 towards the infinite, of negative 1 to the n, times x raised to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. And this, of course, is an expression for tangent inverse of x. Given that tangent inverse of 1 is pi over 4, or the series above with a 1 replacing each x, we have that pi can be written as 4 times the sum, as index n counts from 0 and beyond of negative 1 to the n times 1 over 2n plus 1. This next representation for pi is a continued fraction, seen in the discipline of number theory amongst others. As there is only calculation involved with this example, the pattern for pi is as follows. Pi is equals to 3 plus 1 squared over the quantity 6, plus 3 squared over the quantity 6, plus 5 squared over the quantity 6, plus 7 squared over the quantity 6, plus 9 squared over the quantity 6, plus 11 squared over the quantity 6, dot dot dot, and the same pattern goes on infinitely, wherein each subsequent numerator is a square of the following odd number, added to 6 beneath the preceding one. 
I will show you how my example is an estimate to pi, but not the exact value thereof. If I take the square of 11 divided by 6 and then add 6 to the result, I arrive at 157 over 6. Next, I invert that fraction, multiply 6 by the square of 9, and then divide the result by 157, after which we add 6 once again, arriving at 1212 over 157. Following in the same manner, the next result is 14,965 over 1,212. Then, 120,090 divided by 14,965, followed by 855,225 divided by 120,090. And then finally, the reciprocal of that last fraction times 1 squared, 120,090, divided by 855,225 is approximately 0 0.14042 which, when added to 3, replicates pi until after the second decimal place. As our continued fraction increases, the value for pi becomes more precise. Next, we consider n minus 1 factorial, otherwise known as gamma of n, which is given as the improper integral evaluated from 0 to infinity of x raised to the n minus 1 times e raised to the negative x dx. This implies that quantity negative one-half factorial squared is gamma squared of positive one-half, as one-half minus one is negative one-half. This can be written as the square of the improper integral whose integrand is now x raised to the negative one-half times e raised to the negative x. If we let u be equals to x to the one-half power, then twice du will be x raised to the negative one-half power dx. Hence, our integrand becomes 2 e raised to the negative u squared du, wherein our limits of integration are the same for u as they were for x, and the entire quantity is still being squared. Next, I'd like to explicitly express the square of this quantity as the product of two equivalent integrals. To that end, we express the second integral in terms of v rather than u, in order that we may then express this product as a double integral over u and v. Note how the square of 2 was pulled outside the integrals as 4. This should look very similar to polar coordinates. Given u and v as our rectangular axes, we see that r squared for any radius r is equivalent to u squared plus v squared. As u and v are both evaluated from 0 towards the infinite, that is, both are greater than or equals to 0, we are restricted to the first quadrant, meaning that the angle theta varies from 0 to pi over 2. The Jacobian of the transformation from rectangular to polar coordinates is, of course, r dr d theta. Hence, our double integral may now be expressed as a double integral with integrand e raised to the minus r squared times r dr d theta, where the radius r varies from 0 to infinity and the angle theta is from 0 to pi over 2. I then let w be equals to r squared, giving us 1 half dw equals to r dr. The limits on w are the same as those on r, Hence, our double integral now has an integrand e to the minus w dw times d theta. And the 4 on the outside simplifies to 2 after multiplication by 1 half. Anti-differentiating gives us minus e to the minus w evaluated from 0 to infinity, which simplifies to 1. Taking the limit as w becomes infinite of negative 1 over e to the infinite gives us 0. Hence, positive 1 over e to the 0, or 1, is all that remains. As this is a constant function, the value of the exterior integral with respect to theta is simply the distance between the endpoints, namely pi over 2. Hence, twice pi over 2 leaves us with the fact that pi can now be expressed as a square of the gamma function evaluated at 1 half. This next expression for pi involves the Riemann zeta function. First, we note that the Maclaurin series for sine of pi x is given as pi times x minus quantity pi times x cubed all over 3 factorial, plus the quantity pi times x to the 5th power over 5 factorial, minus the quantity pi times x to the 7th power over 7 factorial, plus dot dot dot. We know that sine is equivalent to 0 along the x-axis, that is, for any integer multiple of pi. Hence, 0 is given by sine of 0, sine of plus or minus 1 times pi, sine of plus or minus 2 times pi, etc. Given that we could factor the polynomial at values of x where it's 0, factoring pi out in front, the first factor for 0 is simply x. The second and third, for negative 1 and positive 1, can be factored as 1 plus x over 1, 
and 1 minus x over 1, respectively. And in the same manner, we will have factors of 1 plus x over 2 times the quantity 1 minus x over 2 for negative and positive 2 times pi. This pattern will repeat for all integers ad infinitum. But of course, save for the factor of x, each of the subsequent pairs of factors can be expressed as the difference of squares. Namely, 1 plus x over 1 times 1 minus x over 1 yields 1 minus x squared over 1. And hence the next product will be 1 minus x squared over 4, followed by quantity 1 minus x squared over 9, etc. Now let's consider the coefficient of x cubed in this expression. If we distribute pi x to the minus x squared over 1 inside the first parenthetical term, the coefficient is minus pi times 1 over 1. We could also distribute pi x to the negative x squared over 4 inside the second set of parentheses, giving us a coefficient of negative pi times 1 over 4. Continuing in this manner, that is, to distribute pi x to the second term inside each parenthetical remark gives us a coefficient of 1 over n squared, giving us negative pi times the sum as the index counts from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. But this sum is the coefficient of x cubed in this series, hence is equivalent to negative pi cubed over 3 factorial, as seen up here circled in yellow in the original expression. Dividing by negative pi gives us that the series over n of 1 over n squared is equivalent to pi squared over 6, because 3 factorial is of course 6. However, the Riemann zeta function at k is defined as the sum as j counts from 1 towards the infinite of 1 over j to the kth power. Hence, the zeta function at 2 is the sum of 1 over j squared, which is pi squared over 6 by our previous analysis. Solving for pi in this equation gives us the square root of 6 times the Riemann zeta function at 2. To recapitulate all of the expressions for pi, we have circumference over diameter from geometry, then three inverse trigonometric functions from trigonometry, the limit of an inverse trigonometric function using graphical analysis from calculus 1, four times the arctangent Maclaurin series from calculus 2, a continued fraction from number theory, the gamma function from number theory, and finally, the Riemann zeta function. Thanks for playing, and I'll see you next time.